As an amateur chef, I am fascinated with the preparation of cooking. For those of you that like to dabble in the kitchen at home, I am sure you are familiar with the task of preparing to cook a dish. The official name given to it is mise en place, meaning setting in place. It is defined as a culinary process in which ingredients are prepared and organized as in a restaurant kitchen before cooking, or as Glamour Magazine calls it, making life easier. Despite the time that it takes to do mise en place, I can tell you that whenever I don't do it, things do not run as smoothly as I would like in the kitchen. I may find myself reaching for an ingredient at the last minute, burning something in a pot, or chopping something in a rushed and ununiform manner. I remember one time I was preparing a signature red curry noodle dish and I realized that I did not have any fish sauce and I was out of limes, which really creates that umami flavor. As the time came to put in those ingredients and I realized that I did not have them, my heart began to race as I was scrambling for a solution. I did not prepare and I knew that while I could finish the dish, it would simply be subpar. And so it was. Just as the chef performs mise en place, the runner does their pre-marathon stretches and the pianist warms up their fingers with scales and the teacher prepares their lesson plan. The kitchen or the running track can be busy and stressful enough. One needs to prepare in order to be ready to perform. Song and music are a universal human language that help us prepare for life's greatest moments. Melody helps us mark special occasions and transitions through life's greatest markers. Whether it be a baby naming, b'nai mitzvah, a wedding or a funeral, music often helps the moment become a moment. But how do we prepare for that moment? Our ancestors had just narrowly escaped slavery under Pharaoh's rule. Trembling with joy and uncertainty and with the remnants of the Sea of Reeds still churning between their toes and under their feet, the Israelites arrive on the other side onto dry land. Only they do not rest or process their newfound freedom. They do not even seek shelter or food, nor search for drinking water. Rather, the first thing that they do is join together in a communal song of freedom and redemption. They compose a song that our people will come to sing daily. Mi chamocha ba'elim Adonai, mi kamocha ne'edar ba'kodesh. Who is like you, our God of gods, you are glorious and sacred. Our ancestors affirm their sacred connection to a higher power and lift up God's praises through sweet singing in sacred harmony. If we look at our prayer of redemption, Micha Mocha, in the context of prayer, we realize too that our Micha Mocha prayer are not the first words out of our mouth at the start of our tefillah. In prayer, we too must prepare and warm up before we are ready to break into a song of rejoicing. We ease into our prayers, remembering, recalling, and reminding ourselves why. We usually begin with a series of psalms or piyutim that direct our attention to God and to community and help our brains and bodies gain a mindset for what is about to happen. Upon completion of these introductory prayers, we next recite Baruch Hu, our call to prayer, our shofar moment, if you will, announcing that we are now ready to pray. And while we may be called to pray, we have to be able to acknowledge certain truths about our faiths, our belief, about our faith, our beliefs, and our history before we acknowledge our freedom. Even here, as we rise for Baruch Hu, we are not yet ready to sing our song of redemption. In his series, Min Chag Ami, My People's Prayer Book, Rabbi Larry Hoffman teaches us that the first part of the prayer for redemption has nothing to do with redemption from Egypt itself. Instead, its original purpose was to affirm our creed, which we know to be the Shema, and precedes the prayer for redemption in our liturgy. It is as if after having recited the Shema, we can now say, all of this is true. We really believe it. There is a God, there is one God, and this God has something to say to us. 
If one continues with this line of reasoning, we must then look at the prayers that precede the Shema in order to have a better context. Shema uvir chotecha, the Shema and its blessings, is one of the oldest rubrics of prayer that we know. It consists of two blessings that precede the Shema itself, and while the language of these blessings alters slightly between morning and evening, the themes are the same, namely creation and revelation. In essence, through our experience with these prayers in the lead up to Micha Mocha, we acknowledge and remind ourselves of our existence, our sense of belonging, and reiterate our relationship with our God, all before singing our song of redemption. In the book of Micah, one of the books of our Tanakh, the prophet Micha speaks to the restoration of Zion and to a fallen Jerusalem that will know future prosperity. Near the end of the book, Micah proclaims, as in the days when you left Egypt, I, God, shall show you wonders. Our sages ask the question, why does the verse say, in the days when you left Egypt, and not in the day? After all, didn't the exodus take place on one single day? The Lubavitcher Rebbe Zichronoli Racha explains that while the Israelites' physical freedom was gained in a single day, the reason the verse in Micah says days is because our inner spiritual and psychological freedom takes a lifetime, each of our lifetimes, to truly embrace and live. The Exodus writ large is a never-ending process. In other words, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was inferring that in order for the Israelites to burst out into song and to understand that they were free upon crossing the Sea of Reeds, they needed to have felt the shackles of slavery, to understand what they had been through, to acknowledge their God, and only then, when they were ready to taste freedom, acknowledge their freedom and truly be free. And when we gather around the Seder table every Pesach and read in the Haggadah, in every generation a person is obligated to view themselves as if they were the ones who went out of Egypt, the same message is being taught. Not only that our own lives were saved in that moment, for we would not have been born as free Jews had the Exodus not taken place, but that the original moment of physical freedom in Egypt bequeathed to every Jew and every generation the responsibility and the privilege of truly understanding that freedom and striving to live it within our own days. Here, the Rebbe extends and deepens his teaching. The exodus from Egypt, he writes, which freed the whole Jewish people, was made possible as a result of the efforts of each individual Jew to redeem their, themselves from their inner psychological and emotional enslavements. Indeed, the story of the exodus really begins when God hears the people crying out in their pain, recognizing and acknowledging their own personal suffering from which they yearn to be free. So how do we know that the Israelites were ready to burst out into song on the other side of the Sea of Reeds? How do we know that in that moment they truly understood what redemption and freedom actually meant for them? We know because of the events that transpired in the lead up to this redemptive moment, the hundred years of slavery, observing the plagues one by one overcome the land and the Egyptian people and witnessing the people and might of their God, and for us in the 21st century, we cannot be ready to pray for that matter, rejoice in song and uh, a song of redemption without the preparation, without knowledge, experience and understanding of how it is we got here. A beautiful example of the necessity and benefit of preparation can be found in the words of famed Spanish musician, Pablo Casal. He writes, for the past eight years, I have started each day in the same manner. It is not a mechanical routine, but something essential to my daily life. I go to the piano and I play two preludes and fugues of Bach. I cannot think of doing otherwise. It is a sort of benediction on the house, but that is not its only meaning for me. It is a rediscovery of the world of which I have the joy of being a part. It fills me with awareness of the wonder of life, with a feeling of the incredible marvel of being a human being. The music is never the same for me, never. 
Each day is something new, fantastic, and unbelievable. For the Israelites, in their moment of redemption at the sea, they were able to rejoice with abandonment and spontaneity, having arrived at this moment experienced and fully prepared to unlock what was next for them. May it soon be our time during these strange and difficult days that we too may experience that freedom when we can come to rejoice in song together. I have no doubt that the melody will be joyous, the words familiar, and we will celebrate in perfect harmony all that life has to offer. Ken Yehi Ratzon. Shabbat Shalom.